Thanks, Mike. Appreciate your showing up today for Absolutely. our veterans uh, recording. You know, we're doing this for posterity to honor the veterans and preserve their story. And any veteran, I mean, I fought the Vietnam War behind a desk, <laughs> so I don't have a big story to tell. But I have. A, I remember another fellow uh, in the Air Force, and we just did his laundry. He just, or he did laundry, is what I'm trying to say. And you know, he's a veteran. It's an important role, though. Someone's That's gotta right. Do it. <clears throat> So let's start. It's uh, January 18th. Yes, 2018. State your name, please. Uh, it's Michael Jones. What's your middle name? Lee. Lee. Michael Lee. Michael Lee Jones. Are you a junior or anything like that? I'm not. I'm actually an only child. Only child. Okay. What is your birth date? I was born May 21st, 1969. I might tell you that library is always interested in when we do these interviews of getting kind of a family tree or something like that that we can, that they're interested in. Sure. So tell me uh, the place of your birth. I was born in uh, northeastern Ohio in a town called Steubenville, Ohio. Steubenville. Steubenville. Okay. And uh, what were your parents' name? What was your father's name? Um, my father's name is Ronald Lee Jones and my mother's name is Catherine Jones. All right. Let's see how far back you can go. Okay. With your father's parents, what okay. were their names? Uh, my dad's uh, dad, his name is Roland Jones. Roland? Roland mm -hmm. Jones. Okay. Um, and my mother's real father uh, was a Faircloth. Uh, his name was John Faircloth. And it's kind of an interesting story there. He was... Um, we grew up in northeast Ohio in the coal mining country, and her father was a coal miner. And he actually died in the mines when she was four years old. Oh. So she was raised by another gentleman who I always knew to be my grandfather, was a guy by the name of Mike Horshock. 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 Almost H -O -R like Horshock. <laughs> H O R S H O K. And, okay. and uh, he married my grandmother, whose also name was Catherine. And uh, that's who I grew up knowing to be my grandfather on my mom's side. Um, okay. On my dad's side, obviously, it was Roland Jones. He was also a coal miner, and his uh, wife's name was Claire. That was my grandmother on my paternal side. What was her maiden name? Proven. Say P again? Proven. P-R-O-V-A-N. All right. Now I'm really going to challenge you. Do you know your great-grandparents' names? I do not. I do not. Um, I'm trying to think on my mom's side. Um, her real father, who was a Faircloth, her grandfather would have been Jack Faircloth. I don't know what her grandmother's name was. I think it also was Catherine, because I think there's a line of Catherines in her family. So I think it was Jack and Catherine Faircloth. On my dad's side, I don't know. We weren't as close with my dad's side. I mean, we, they were kind of the grandparents we saw at Thanksgiving and Christmas, just because of distance mm -hmm. areas. So I wasn't quite as close with them. I was much more closer with my maternal grandparents. Okay. And um, now you said you're the only child? You didn't only have child. any brothers and no sisters? No brothers or sisters. Okay. Now, where did you go to school then? Start with high school. Uh, well, let me live back up if I could. I yeah. grew up in um, Carroll County, which is Northeast Ohio. Went to school up until eighth grade at Carrollton um, uh, Elementary and Carrollton Middle School. And then my dad, he was a principal. And that's what moved us to Portsmouth because he got a better job here in Portsmouth. Uh, and so we ended up moving to Portsmouth when I was at the end of my eighth grade year. So I came to Portsmouth High School uh, and started here as a freshman. Was he the principal? He was the principal. Of Portsmouth High School. At that time. He was the principal from... We moved in 1983, and then he retired as the principal in 1994, mm -hmm. and then he took over as the assistant superintendent for four or five years till he retired. Okay. Is he still living? He's still living. Where still is living. he live? Where does he live? But my, both my parents are still alive. They live on uh, Meadow Lane here in Portsmouth off in, Sunrise. In Portsmouth. In okay. Portsmouth. Okay. Um, you're married? Are you married? Then? I'm married. Okay. Yeah, my wife's name's Wendy. She is originally from Portsmouth. Um, What's her maiden name? Smith. Wendy Smith. Wendy What's Smith. her middle name? Joe. 
Wendy Jo. Jo. Okay. Jo. Um, and do you have children? You have children? I have two boys. Uh -huh. uh, my oldest son is Brandon Jones, and he uh, is a junior at Miami University this year. Okay. And How old is he now? He's 21. He'd be, yeah. And my youngest is Austin Jones, and he is a freshman at Ohio State, and he just turned 19. What are their majors? Have they decided on anything yet? My oldest is a physics major, um, and my youngest, he's starting out in the business school. We'll see if he continues that. He's still a little unsure what he wants to do, but right now it's, he's doing a business, so we'll see. Now, your occupation at this time in your life, what are you? I'm an attorney, uh -huh. and currently my role is I'm uh, the domestic relations court magistrate, which is kind of like... Um, kind of like a pseudo judge, so to speak. I work for Judge Buckler, who's the actual elected judge, and I work for him uh, as his magistrate. None of your boys have uh, picked law as maybe a career? I've discouraged them from that. So. You have discouraged them. <laughs> so, no, I don't think they're going to go down the law issue. So. Okay. Um, now, where did you go to uh, college? You, okay, I graduated Portsmouth High School in 1987. Right. And then I went to Capital University undergraduate, um, graduated there in 1991. What degree did you get there? I got a degree in uh, business administration economics mm -hmm. and decided, wasn't really sure what I wanted to do with my life, so I decided to uh, go to law school and went to Capital Law School and graduated there in 1994. 94. And then... Um, um, have you been to any other schools, like graduate school or anything like that? Um, I've done, um, in my military uh, role, I'm also uh, a lawyer in the military, uh, I've went to the University of Virginia and done some schooling there. That's where the, the Army, I'm in the Navy, but the Army has its um, legal school there at the University of Virginia, and I've, I've been there several times. Well, when did you go into the military? You're in the Navy, you said. I'm in the Navy. Mm -hmm. When did you do that? Um, when I was in law school, in my second year of law school, I worked in the career services um, department. That was kind of like my work study job. I worked there for a couple hours a week. And they had uh, a gentleman from the Navy came in and was kind of trying to recruit, you know, law students when they graduate to, to join the Navy. And I kind of just sparked up a conversation with him. And uh, I ended up applying uh, to... Uh, be commissioned in the Navy my second year of law school. And so I was accepted, and which was kind of nice because then I knew once I graduated law school, I had a job. So I immediately, after I graduated law school, um, went and worked with the Navy. By the way, when were you married? I was married in 1989. I was a, a junior in college when I got married. Okay, junior in that capital? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. What was the date of that? Do you remember? April 5th. Yeah, I better remember that, right? <laughs> April 15th, 1989. Okay. Is that your only marriage now? Yes. Okay. <laughs> only marriage Hopefully now. it will be <laughs> my only one ever. Okay. Um, now, when you graduated from uh, Capital Law School, you knew you had a job in the Navy. Did they send you to a, um, like, officer basic? Uh, yeah, what, what I did was... Um, <clears throat> Uh, I the first probably three months out of law school, I studied for the bar, which was in July. Mm -hmm. So I took the bar exam, and then immediately after I took the bar exam, I went to um, officer candidate school, which is basically you know where you kind of learn the, the military lifestyle, and that was in Newport, Rhode Island. And uh, I was up there for not quite three months. Did your wife go with you? She did not, not that time. Did you have uh, kids at that time? We did not. Mm -hmm. We did not have any kids at that time. Um, so I was in Newport, and she was living in Columbus at the time working. And typically, after you graduate from officer candidate school, if you're a lawyer, you go on to what's called Naval Justice School, which is also in Newport, Rhode Island. It's kind of like um, law school for the military. Um, and I was fortunate because I didn't have my bar results yet. And the next justice school class started at the end of October. And they put me in that school, and when they put me in the justice school, I was able to bring my wife up to Newport. So she came up, and we were there for about four months in Newport. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. Um, 
That's Newport, Rhode Island. Newport, Rhode Island. Okay. And so after that four months, now so far you've, you've been in the military about seven months. About seven months. Okay. And uh, then uh, you passed the bar, thank heavens. I passed the bar. That was the days, you, I remember that was before the internet. Uh -huh. uh, and so back in those days, this is just a funny story, um, you used to actually have to wait until 9 o'clock in the morning and you would have to call the Supreme Court to see if you passed the bar. And so another one of my buddies who was in the Navy was also from Ohio and he had taken the bar. So we went, and that time he had pay phones. So we were both at pay phones calling the Supreme Court. And of course at nine o'clock it's busy. So we both get through around 9.15 in the morning. And I, you know, I said, you know, I need to know if I passed the bar. And they said, what's your name? I said, Michael Jones. And I said, what's your middle initial? And I told them L, and they said, oh, you passed. Apparently there was a Michael P. Jones who did not pass that particular bar. So I like, clarified, I'm like, you're talking about the Michael Jones from, you know, I gave my address just to make sure it was the right one. But we both passed. You both passed. We both passed. I'll, I'll tell you this story, I won't mention his name, but <laughs> one of our colleagues, he called to see if he'd passed. And I said, sorry, you didn't pass. And so you can imagine how that makes you feel. Oh. Yeah, and, then they, and then about 10 seconds later, five seconds later, say, oh, wait a minute, you did pass. You did pass. <laughs> <laughs> so one of our colleagues did. Wow. It. So now you've passed and you've been in the military for uh, seven months and what's going to happen to you? Well, um, it was around January, we got orders, all the people who are at Justice School, we got orders to where we're going to be going. So uh, I ended up going to be stationed in Jacksonville, Florida at Jacksonville Naval Air, Naval Air Station. Um, but before we went to Jacksonville, I had to go uh, to Norfolk, Virginia, and we had to do what was called a Lawyer at Sea program, which was basically making sure that, you know, us lawyers who really weren't in the real Navy at this point, we just went to, we went to candidate school and then we went to justice school, but we hadn't been in the real Navy yet. So they wanted you to go on board a ship for for several weeks just to kind of get a feel for the people that you're going to be either representing or, or prosecuting which was in my case so I was on board the USS Enterprise uh, for about a month uh, and we actually went out to sea for a couple weeks so that was a that was a pretty good experience. I bet the Enterprise being an aircraft carrier. It was right? aircraft carrier mm -hmm. so we got to go out and and uh, you know watch actual flight operations of the the, the carrier with you know, F-14s flying off and on the, wow. off and on the carriers. Pretty, pretty, pretty neat experience. When was that? What um, was that during the Cold War? Or? Uh, that would have been during January of 1995. 95. So mm -hmm. you know, we're still dealing with the kind of the Gulf War issues. It wasn't quite as mm -hmm. hot at that point, but. Mm-hmm. Okay. So. Well, yeah. Now you're out at sea, and you come back, and you get off, and you're going to go to Jacksonville. Go to Jacksonville, Florida. How long were you in Jacksonville? Four and a half years. Okay, four and a half years. Now you're an attorney Correct. in the Navy. Uh, do they do they have some attorneys that are strictly prosecutors, and then some attorneys that are strictly defense, or how how do they work that? Uh, what happened with me is is that I initially went in as a prosecutor, and I actually stayed there, which is a little unusual. I stayed there my entire three-year tour. Um, in Jacksonville? In Jacksonville as a prosecutor. As a prosecutor. Uh, but typically <clears throat> there's uh, individuals that will do prosecution, they usually do it for a year and a half, and then you switch to defense and be, be a defense attorney. And then some do legal assistance, which is basically, you know, providing advice to the service members and their families, wills, powers of attorney, you know, those types of issues, landlord-tenant issues. Mm -hmm. um, why so long as a prosecutor for you? you, you. Uh, well, what happened was is, um, we had, the, the Navy was kind of reorganizing how they did their um, commands for legal services. And so we were like a, a new organization. And I was kind of like one of the first people that were part of that new organization, how they were going to do it. It used to be your boss um, or commanding officer was the commanding officer of both the prosecution and the defense. And there was always been an argument that was a kind of a conflict that you know you really can't be your boss if you're on opposite sides of the case. So the Navy in about 1994 decided to separate and they had a, 
commanding officer for the defense and a commanding officer for the prosecution. So I was part of the prosecution and I was just ended up being the senior person and it just was coincidence they said you want to just stay on and be the senior trial counsel for the next year and a half. I loved that part of the job so I said absolutely I'll do that. What kind of cases did you prosecute? Was it the whole gamut? I mean, whole gamut. I mean, the military is just a reflection of civilian society. I mean, um, I I was I don't want to say fortunate, but you know I did um, cases ranging from petty theft, drug a lot of drug cases. Um, I ended up doing three murder cases and several child sex abuse cases. Mm -hmm. so. These are murder cases, being sailors killing civilians or. Killing sailors? Both, or? yeah. Mm -hmm. Anytime, the military, the way the military jurisdiction works is that um, a lot of people think that it has to be a, an offense that occurs on the military installation. But we have, the military has jurisdiction to prosecute anybody who wears the uniform wherever the offense takes place. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we'll work with the local authorities and say, you know, hey, this is a high profile case. Does your prosecution or DA want to take it? And we would allow them on certain cases, but we we had the right to come in and say, even though this happened in your county outside of our installation, we're prosecuting them. So mm -hmm. this might sound like a might sound like a silly question, but your jurisdiction was only naval military, right? I mean, you couldn't try a army person. I could. Um, you could. Um, we we primarily the Navy is comprised of the. The Naval Service is the Navy and the Marines. So I primarily was prosecuting uh, sailors and Marines. Um, but we could, under certain circumstances, prosecute Army and Air Force and Coast Guard folks too. But that, that's very unusual. But to answer your question, you can. That's interesting. I didn't yeah. think. Okay. Um, so you're there for uh, four years, one year as a, as a defense attorney. Then what happened to you? I did three years. I never was defense. I did three years as prosecutor. And then um, I was what was called a staff judge advocate, which is basically I stayed, we like Jacksonville, and I tried to get another job in Jacksonville. So I was the, what's called the staff judge advocate, which is basically a fancy word for, I was the lawyer for the base commanding officer, the whole entire Naval Air Station base. Mm -hmm. So I was his, at that time, it was a he, legal advisor. So I did that for a little over a year and a half. Was that interesting? It's very interesting work. I mean, you know, you, you, you have all kinds of issues that come up. Probably the biggest issue that I would deal with is twice a year, Jackson had a naval um, air show. So we would have, you know, the Blue Angels come in and you would be amazed at all the, the technical requirements, you know, noise ordinances that you got to worry about and just setting up all the, making sure that, you know, the other airports are aware that you're going to be flying these, you know, Blue Angels in. So, I mean, it, it sounds like it's not that big a deal when you have an air show, but behind the scenes, it's, it's sometimes can be a nightmare to set those up. So I, that was one of the big things was the air shows for me. Um, we also had a hospital on the base, so I provided advice to the, uh, the commanding officer of the hospital as well. Suppose you had a medical malpractice issue in a hospital would you handle that case or we were we we did like a lot of like uh, assisting because it, if it's um, a medical malpractice case and the and the navy gets sued actually the u.s attorney uh, in that particular district represents the government mm -hmm. so we would basically kind of be um, assistance to the U.S. attorney in those situations, provide them, you know, resources and assistance, getting them, you know, documents and evidence that they need to prepare for their case. But actually the U.S. attorney, their civil division section comes in and represents the government. You had a lot of, in that capacity then, you had a lot of interaction with civilians, did you not? I mean, being the base commander's attorney, did you have that situation? We did. Another big issue we had too that I dealt with was the the navy exchange or px as a lot of people say and commissary so you've got a lot of um, petty thefts that come by where civilians who aren't in the military but usually it's their family members or friends you know will, will steal something or something so we have the ability if it now that situation since it happens on the installation we can actually prosecute those civilians so well um is that where your child, first son, was born? Both Maybe. my kids were born in Jacksonville. 
In Jacksonville, Florida. Jacksonville, Florida. Okay. Um, then what happened to you? So you've got a, your family there in Jacksonville, and your tour comes to an end. I um, we had to make a decision um, whether or not we were going to stay or, or, or leave the military, um, at least active duty. And uh, I actually had orders to go to Rota, Spain. It was going to be our next our next uh, uh, duty station. But my wife, we just had our second child, and. Uh, she was a little leery about going to, it would have been three years to go to Rhoda. So we decided um, that we were going to get out at that time and come back to Ohio. So we, we ended up getting out on active duty at that time. Looking back, you know, sometimes we have regrets, you know, because we wonder what it would have been like to go to Rhoda, Spain. But, you know, I think it was good for everyone because my family's here in Ohio, her family's here, and, you know, I wanted our kids to have a good relationship with their grandparents. and. Right. So we just made a personal decision to come back to Ohio. And you came back to Portsmouth? No, actually. Where? We came back uh, to Lima, Ohio, of all places, uh, which is northwest Ohio. It's about three, a little over three hours from Portsmouth. Why Lima? Well, um, when I was interviewing for jobs, uh, we kind of wanted to go to Columbus because that was kind of where I went to school. I was familiar with Columbus, like Columbus. It's only about you know an hour and a half from Portsmouth. Would have been a nice way for you know the grandparents to be able to see the kids so I actually interviewed for law firms in Columbus and the law firm that ultimately offered me a job I thought well, I was going to be working in their Columbus office well at the last minute they said we really don't need you in Columbus we need you in Lima and by this time I've already told the Navy you know I put in my papers I'm getting out and I told my wife and she goes Lima why are we going to Lima? But it ended up working out good. So we ended up going, and I worked at the Lima, Ohio branch of the law firm I was with, and uh, we stayed there for seven years. Seven the, years seven in Lima? Years in Lima. And then, um, you, didn't, did you, you didn't sever your ties with the Navy altogether, did you? No, I immediately, once we moved back to Lima, I, I was officially discharged from the Navy active duty in December of 1998 and I immediately in January of 1999 affiliated with the reserves and I've been affiliated with the reserves ever since. Where is your reserve unit? Um, I, I'm thinking or is it like the Army you have a certain post you, like the engineers out here on Coles Boulevard or something like that? Uh, I wish. Um, the, the Navy Reserve um, what, what I'm affiliated with is the JAG Corps, which is basically the Judge Advocate General Corps, which is basically the corps representing the lawyers. Um, there are very limited what we call billets or positions for reserve JAG attorneys, and most of them are obviously located at major Navy installations. Mm -hmm. So there's not a whole lot of Navy in Ohio as you know. So all of my duty stations ever since I affiliated with the reserves have been outside of Ohio. For instance, I was spent eight years in Washington, D.C. Eight uh, years? Eight years, um, where pretty much once a month I would fly to Washington, D.C. I spent four years in the Pentagon and I spent four years at the Navy Yard. Um, what I, was that? I'm, I'm trying to get a picture of that. They would fly you, is this for your Weekend meetings? For my weekend, I would usually I would usually get go to Columbus and pick up a flight, usually Friday evening. I would fly direct flight from Columbus, a commercial flight from um, Columbus right into uh, Washington Reagan. Um, they would always put us up in a hotel, the Navy, that's part of the um, resources that we're able to get. They'll put us up in a birthing. And uh, I would take the metro to the hotel, you know, the subway. And, uh, and then I would either go to the Navy Yard and do my you know, Saturday and Sunday drill, or I would be at the Pentagon. So, and then my two weeks where I would have to go and do my two week period of time, I would either be at the Navy Yard for two weeks or the Pentagon. So I was, I was, so I was there for DC for eight years. Um, I was in Norfolk um, for almost four years. Um, let's see. Uh, I was 
deployed to Bahrain in 2006. Bahrain? Bahrain. <laughs> okay. How long were you there? Um, not quite four months. I went to Bahrain. What do you do in Bahrain for four months? I mean, there some sailors need representation or prosecution or? Uh, at that time, um, for the longest time, uh, the reserves role was typically to replace active duty folks who have been deployed. So a lot of times we would have to like backfill at major installations like San Diego or Norfolk or mm -hmm. Washington DC. Mm -hmm. Well around 2005 the active duty folks kind of came out and said, for, at least in the JAG Corps, we're done doing deployments for a while. So instead of us backfilling positions at the major installations while those JAGs went and deployed, the reserves started deploying. And so um, there was a need in Bahrain at that time, um, so I was one that was called to go serve in Bahrain. What's Bahrain like? Uh, it's, it's, I think at that time it was the third wealthiest country in the world. It's obviously oil was their big industry. Um, it's very uh, modern, um, kind of a westernized um, area, very small. It's right there uh, on the Persian Gulf. Um, it borders um, Saudi Arabia, uh, very warm. <laughs> when I got off the plane, I got off the plane in September, and I think the, uh, the flight attendant said, you know, um, you know, welcome to Bahrain, temperatures, I think it was 120 degrees when we got off the plane. It's, it's, it's hot. My son got off the plane in Kuwait, and the 120 yeah. degrees smacked him right in the face. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very warm. Um, <laughs> But um, I was very surprised because at that time there was a lot of, you know, tension was still mounting with, you know, um, I don't want to say anti-Muslim, but there was kind of that, you know, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of animosity. Uh, what year were you there? 2006. 2006. 2006. So this is after 9-11. After 9-11. Mm -hmm. um, but still there was just, you know, people were still, I think, um, I say they were ignorant of, of a lot of things. And it opened my eyes because the, the Bahraini people were extremely friendly um, and caring people and opened their, their uh, homes to us. I mean, they were very friendly uh, people. So I, I got a completely different um, perspective from, from what I, I kind of went into that tour with. Uh, when 9-11 happened, um, was there any special activation of you or did what, what happened with I did you not get the Navy? I did not get activated immediately after 9-11. That's, that's the time frame I was telling you where primarily most of my colleagues who were deployed weren't deployed to Afghanistan or to Iraq uh, or to Kuwait. They were deployed to San, San Diego or Norfolk or Jacksonville because the active duty folks were the ones that were picked up and said, you've got to go. So they did that for, you know, almost five years. And then right around 2006, they said, we're not doing that no more. Mm -hmm. So anytime you needed a, a person or persons to deploy to those locations, it was primarily reserve folks. When you were deployed, uh, was your wife able to go with you at any of these? She was not. When I went to Bahrain, she was not able to go. Um, contact at that time was a, pretty good. I mean, we had, you had email at that time and you, know, you could communicate um, through, uh, you know, we had good phone service at that time. The time difference was probably the biggest issue in Bahrain. Mm -hmm. um, but we had pretty good communication back and forth with family. So that, that's four months in Bahrain, and, and did, 2005, did you say? 2000? 2006. 2006. 2006, yeah. Then what happened to you? You came back, and you're still in the reserves? Still in the reserves, came back to my, to, to my job. To Lima? or <laughs> to, to Lima. Okay. Um, Bahrain and, to Lima, okay. <laughs> Lima, then to Bahrain, then back to Lima. Mm -hmm. And then we decided that we really wanted to come to Portsmouth. Um, my kids were getting a little bit older at this time. Uh, my parents were getting a little bit older. Um, that three and a half hour drive just, it, it's not that far, but you know, we wanted, we wanted to be closer to home. So mm -hmm. I convinced my law firm to open up a branch office in Portsmouth. 
Who was it, their law firm? At that time, it was called Baron Piper, uh, was the name of the law firm. Baron Piper, the main office was out of Mansfield, Ohio. We had an office at that time in uh, Columbus, uh, an office uh, outside of Cleveland, Lima, um, and I convinced them to open up an office in Portsmouth. So I actually came down and was a man, one man shop. Uh, Where was your office? I was right there across from the courthouse. Um, Charlie Kirby is now in that office now. That, okay. that was my office. It was, uh, at that time, um, Nancy Hawk, uh, real estate gallery. I had half of the building and then her real estate company was in the other half. I think it's like a massage therapist maybe in there now. I think so, yeah. yeah. So okay. yeah. And so Charlie's still there. And Charlie's still there, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So. Well, uh, what kind of law did this uh, law firm do? Just about... We primarily did insurance defense litigation. Oh, okay. So, mm -hmm. um, and this area, the reason I convinced them was I was able to get a lot of our clients at that time didn't really have any local counsel. A lot of their counsel for a lot of the insurance companies we represented were from, you know, Columbus or Cincinnati. So I said, you know, would you be willing to give us the work in that area if I opened up an office? And that's kind of what prompted us to move. So. Well, life kind of takes a turn for you down here, doesn't it? I mean, you get into politics. What, ha what happened with all that? That's an interesting story. I had no desire to get into politics. Um, but here you are. I know, here I am. <laughs> so uh, this was around 2007. Uh, I had been here because we moved back to Portsmouth. Right, right to, after Bahrain. Yeah, well, shortly after Bahrain, <laughs> we moved back to Portsmouth. Um, I went to school uh, with the with the police chief, who the current police chief. Um, he was not the police chief at the time. Is that Rob? Rob Weir. Okay. And uh, uh, Rob is also uh, in the Navy. He was Navy active duty for several years and he was a reservist. So he uh, and I didn't really keep in contact, but you know, we saw each other in small talk. And he stopped by my office one day and just completely out of the blue and said, would you be interested in running for city solicitor? And I said, absolutely not. I don't have no desire to run for city solicitor. And he said, well, you know, um, the current person in that position has been there for a while. You know, we think it's time that we, you know, get some new blood there. You know, we, we've had some concerns with some issues that were there. Um, what if I could guarantee that, you know, our union would support you? I, I could get the fire department to support you, probably get the sheriff's department to support you. You know, put the word out, and uh, what do you think about that? I said, let me think about it. So I talked to my wife, and she said, what do you got to lose? I'm like, okay. <laughs> so so we put her uh, name in the ring, and, you know, I don't know if it was lucky or unlucky, but we won. <laughs> so, Holy cow. <laughs> So, so now you're a city solicitor, you're in the Navy Reserves, and uh, did, did you keep a private practice of any kind going? A little bit, because um, with city solicitor, I mean, you can still maintain a private practice, so I maintained a little bit. I had to give up the law firm, um, so I had to notify my law firm that, you know, hey, I'm going to be running for office, and it was, it was a very mutual, I mean, they were probably a little upset at first because they're like, you know, we just invested, you know, our resources to come down here, now you're telling us you want to run for prosecutor. Um, but it was, it was an amicable relationship. Did they keep an office here? They did not, because I was the only attorney here. So mm -hmm. they decided just we'll just close that office down. I kept the actual building for about a year just to keep my private practice going for a little bit. Um, but to answer your question, yeah, I, I continued private practice a little bit when I was a solicitor. And all the while now, you're going to uh, your weekly uh, reserve meetings in Washington or wherever. Monthly, yeah, we'd go once a month. M monthly, yeah. uh huh, for a weekend, and then you'd have to do your two weeks. Where, where was that usually? In Norfolk or where? Um, during that time, I was in D.C. So I was um, I was at the Pentagon for four years, and then the Navy Yard for four years. Okay, what's that like working in the Pentagon? Uh, That's a big building. It's a very big building, and you know it's very confusing. Have you have you been to the Pentagon? I've just seen pictures. It's uh, it's very confusing. It, it easily get lost in it because every every corridor looks the same. I mean, there's certain ways after you've been there a while you can identify certain pictures on the wall and flags <laughs> on the wall to figure out where you're at. But the first probably year I was there, 
I would always get lost in the Pentagon. Because, you know, you're not there every day. I was there just on weekends. And, mm -hmm. and the weekends, there's not as many people there, obviously. So mm -hmm. it's much easier to get lost in there because it's pretty much quiet. <laughs> what was the Navy Yard like when you say, what is a Navy Yard? The Navy Yard is, um, if you're familiar, if you're a sports fan, the Washington Nationals built their brand new stadium. Um, uh, and the Navy Yard is literally like three blocks from where the Nationals built their stadium. Uh, it's um, close to where the uh, Marine Barracks are. Uh, what do uh, they do at the Navy Yard? Keep the ships and... No, it's, it's, it, you think that it would be their ships there. The Navy Yard is basically administrative offices. Um, it's where the, uh, the Navy, from, from the military legal standpoint, the, the Court of Appeals for the military is there. Mm. The uh, actual admiral uh, of the Navy is there. That's where, that's where he's headquartered now um, and his assistant. Um, so a lot of the kind of the higher ranking officials in the, the Navy JAG Corps are at the Navy Yard. And then there's all kinds of other facilities there. But from a legal standpoint, it's pretty much our Court of Appeals is there and all our high ranking officials are there. So far, only, I've heard you say you've only been on a ship once. Is that right? No, I've been on a ship. Uh, if you want to back up, uh, <laughs> uh, when I was a prosecutor, uh, I was stationed, as, as I said, at Jacksonville Naval Air Station. But there's actually, at that time, there were three bases in Jacksonville. There was the air station where I was stationed, and there was also Cecil Field, which is now closed, which is another air station. And then there was Mayport, uh, which is actually on the coast, because Jacksonville was more inland, uh, what the air station was. Um, Mayport is on the coast. That's where actually all of the Navy ships were. Uh, in that base. So mm -hmm. at that time, the major carrier group that was there was the the Kennedy. So What's the what? The Kennedy. The Kennedy. The Kennedy. That, the aircraft. The aircraft carrier the Kennedy. Mm -hmm. So what we would do is is um, our region, so to speak, for trials that I would do trials in is we would go all the way up to Charleston, South Carolina, because there's a there's a naval base in Charleston. Um, I did cases at Charleston, I did cases at Kings Bay, Georgia, uh, which is where all the Navy submarines are on the East Coast. Uh, obviously Jacksonville, Mayport, um, all the way down to um, Key West, Florida. There, at that time there was a base in Key West, Florida. All the way over to Corpus Christi, Texas. So that was kind of our, they called it Navy Region Southeast. So that Southeast region uh, was the region that I basically covered to cover court martials. So when when you went to these places, it's kind of like riding the circuit, so to speak. But were you on a ship? No, I would I would typically fly. Like if we had a case, like I had a case in Corpus Christi, Texas, I would get on a Navy flight and we'd fly from Jacksonville to Corpus Christi. But to answer your question about the ships, is when the the Kennedy was deployed locally, you know, out in the in the ocean for a while. You know, there's upwards of 6,200 men and women are on those carriers. So if you have 62 men and women on a carrier, there's going to be probably people that do things they're not supposed to do. It's just the nature of humans. So instead of taking the court martial from the ship and bringing it back to the land, which you'd have to bring all the witnesses back, the accused back, and it, it could be very expensive, we took the court martial to the ship. So there were probably five or six occasions where myself as the prosecutor, defense counsel, court reporter, and the judge would take a cod and we'd fly from Naval Air Station Jacksonville and land on the carrier. How would you land on the carrier? By a helicopter or would you land? Uh, it was usually an eight person um, aircraft and we would actually land with the tail hook down. Really? Uh, and then Probably the even more interesting part was when you would leave the ship, you would be catapulted off the carrier on the, the cod. And it's just a quick funny story. Um, you know, we're lawyers, we know nothing about you know, flying airplanes. So the very first time I had to be shot off of the carrier, you're sitting actually backwards. So I'm sitting facing the aircraft carrier. So it's myself and there's the defense counsel. I think there were three seats and three seats all facing this way, and then 
three seats facing this way, and then the pilot and his co-pilot. So we're getting ready to be catapulted off, and the, the pilots there, they had fun with the stupid lawyers because they said, okay, you're probably going to need this bag. They gave us the bag in case you throw up, and you know, they're, we're like, you really think we're going to need this? Like, oh, you're probably going to need it the first time. Well, what they don't tell you, the pilots don't tell you the very first time you do this, is that when you get catapulted off that, you're coming from this part and you're going straight down for a minute. So it looks like, and especially when you're looking back at their ship, that you're going straight into the ocean. <laughs> they don't tell you that. <laughs> so the first time we got catapulted off, I really thought that the aircraft was going, gonna die. I'm going to die. In the ocean. <laughs> and, and I can still remember the, uh, the pilot, his co-pilot, laughing hysterically when we thought, you know, we're screaming in the back of the plane, thinking, oh my gosh, we're going to die. <laughs> <laughs> and you heard him laughing. Mm -hmm. I heard him laughing. So. Okay. You, you said a word there, uh, maybe I just misunderstood it, when you landed on the what? Uh, when we land on the carrier, there's actually a, a tail hook yeah. that comes down off the plane, and there's there's three cables. And if you miss the first one, hopefully you catch the second or third one. But if what happens is if you don't catch either one of those, then they'll have to do what's called a touch and go, which is basically the plane touches down and goes back up and has to go all the way around again. So Did that happen? We never had to do that, fortunately. <laughs> never had to do that. <laughs> oh, I'm going to die again. <laughs> Okay, um, interesting. Um, so, so you'd actually be flown out to the aircraft carrier. Were Were you ever on other ships? you I've got you on two aircraft carriers now. Destroyers I was on, or anything? I was never on any destroyers. <clears throat> I was on a, a, a little frigate. Um, now it was in port, and we actually had to go there and, and do a hearing. It was called the uh, USS Samuel Roberts. Um, but the only ships that I've actually been on that went out to sea was the Enterprise and the Kennedy. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you think you're going to retire out of the military then? You're, you've been with it a while. How long have you been in now? 23 years. I did, um, well, a total of about six years active duty and uh, a little over 16 years reserves. So I'm, I'm retirement eligible now, um, but mm -hmm. I'm going to probably try to do 30 years and call it quits. Tell me about Guantanamo. I know from the personal story that... You've told me about that, that, that but uh, you were deployed to Guantanamo more than just a few months. You were there. Yeah, for I was there for a year. Um, that was uh, another um, unexpected turn in our lives that probably ended up being one of the most rewarding things I've ever done in the military. Uh, uh, just to kind of give you a little background, um, well, we we have an annual conference of. Uh, all the, the, the reserve JAGs get together once a year. There's about 400 of us total. And we get together once a year, just kind of like continue education, kind of just catch up and see old friends. Um, and we had kind of been expecting that they've run out of volunteers for a lot of these deployments. And the Navy right now, we support three different types of deployments. We support um, uh, Afghanistan. Uh, we have currently have three JAG attorneys in the Navy who are in Afghanistan currently. We have four in Djibouti, uh, which is uh, on the Somalian coast. Um, and we have three in Gitmo, Navy Reserves. So when we were at our conference, uh, and this would have been in 2016, uh, the word on the street was, get ready, because we've run out of volunteers, and there's a good chance you're going to possibly get a call. And then you start doing the math, and you think, okay, I haven't been called since 2006. It's now 2016. I see all these people in the audience that I know, and I know they've been deployed because they've been volunteers or gotten the call themselves. So you start thinking, and you're thinking, there's a good chance I'm going to get the call. So I kind of like was preparing my family that there's a good chance that I'm going to get deployed. So, and you always get the phone call if you're deployed from Virginia, which is a 757 area code. So I remember it was, uh, it was in April. Um, they usually try to give you um, at least six to eight months notice so you can put your 
affairs in order. Navy's been very good about giving as much advance notice to people. That's a long time. It's a long time. Good and bad. And, and I'll tell you the, the good and the bad of that. Um, so it was a Friday. Uh, I just finished court. It was about 4.35. I'm in my car. I'm going home. Phone rings. I look down. 757. I'm like, ah. Oh. So you know what it is. It's one of those things as, you, as a reservist, you, you, it's not that you don't want the call, but you kind of like, oh my goodness, this is, this, is, this is real. So, of course, that was the call, and they said that uh, I'd been selected to uh, go to Guantanamo Bay. And, uh, you know, I heard Guantanamo Bay, I'm like, oh my goodness. You know, Guantanamo Bay had such a negative connotation for so many people. Um, you know, at that time, you know, we still had President Obama, who for, you know, eight years was, you know, basically trying to shut down Guantanamo Bay. Um, so there was a lot of just negativity and uh, not a whole lot of optimism around <laughs> Guantanamo Bay. Um, so I got the call and was told that I was going to deploy to Guantanamo in September. So, you know, I got almost seven months advance notice that I was going to go, which is good because you can kind of get your or family in order, prepare them for that. It's bad because it's a long time. It's almost like two deployments. It's like you're waiting for the deployment and then the actual deployment. So that's the bad thing about getting so much advance notice because you're always on pins and needles. It's like, okay, I got two more months. I got, you know, one more month. I got two weeks. I got one week. So it's always that just waiting for the uncertainty. So. so then you went. So then I went. So went to Norfolk for a week just to kind of, um, you know, do some pre-deployment training, you know, get all your shots and all that, get, you know, medical, make sure you're good to go. And we got on an aircraft at Naval Air Station in Norfolk and flew straight to Cuba. Just for the people watching, there's 50 years from now, Guantanamo Bay now is the Naval Station, a Naval Station. Correct. Where we keep prisoners we capture in the war on terrorism. Correct. And that's a lot of the, I think, the misunderstanding with Guantanamo is that Guantanamo is a Navy base. There is 3,000 men and women who are there will always be there because it's such a important part of our defense. Um, there's ships there. Um, so Guantanamo Bay Navy base will always be there. And it was never in discussion about shutting down the Navy base. What's been in discussion of is shutting down the prison. Um, and that is part of what is called JTF Gitmo or Joint Task Force Guantanamo Bay. And that is basically where they have a series of prisons where all the um, terrorists from 9-11 who were captured, um, that's where they're currently housed. And at one point, I think at the maximum, there were five prisons and 726, um, we call them detainees, who were actually there at Guantanamo Bay. That's a whole lot. That's a whole lot. When I left, um, on June 23rd, 2017, one of those dates you never forget when you go home, <laughs> um, there were a total of 41. 41, down 41. from 700 and some. Yes. Of those 700 and some, a lot of them, of course, uh, where, where did they go? They went to other countries? Uh, most of them, or a lot of them, were released back to their, either their home country or other countries who agreed to take them. Mm -hmm. um, did they go back to the battlefield that you know of? A few did. A few mm -hmm. did. Yeah. What was your job at Guantanamo then? What did you do there? Um, from what I can tell you, and I don't, I don't mean to mean this to be, there's certain things obviously I can't tell you, but uh, what I did from a general standpoint is, is that um, there are currently uh, three prosecution teams that are actively doing what are called commissions or trials at Guantanamo Bay. There are what is referred to as the 9-11 team, and the 9-11 team is the prosecutors and defense team who actually uh, are responsible for the prosecution and defense of <coughs> the five main individuals who the United States government believes are responsible for the planning of 9-11. Those guys are still there? They're still there. Mm -hmm. Probably the most famous is a guy by the name of 
KSM or Kashid, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed is probably the most famous person, several books written about. Have KSM. you ever met him? I have. <laughs> I have. Um, so there's the 9 11 team, which is the five individuals that the U.S. believes are responsible for the terror attacks. Um, there's also another team. Um, if you remember several years ago, the USS Cole was hit by a speedboat. Um, the individual uh, who's been charged with that is a guy by the name of Al Nashiri. And Nashiri is um, being prosecuted for the coal bombing, and there is a whole prosecution and defense team for Al Nashiri. Just that one guy? Just that one guy. Okay. Then there's another team for an individual known as Al Iraqi. Al Iraqi is considered to be the leader of Al Qaeda when it was at its height. And there's a prosecution and defense team for Al Iraqi. That one guy. That one guy. Mm -hmm. I was on the 9 11 team. So okay. I provided prosecution support for the 9 11 mm -hmm. individuals. Well, the 9 11 team focused on five guys. Five guys. They're, they, they, they're the five that have actually been charged. And the other two guys, so that's seven. What happened to the other? We've got <laughs> 41 guys there. And there what are the other guys? There are two prisons that are currently in operation in Guantanamo. Um, there is a, a prison that houses what are called high-value detainees. High-value detainees are detainees who are, we believe as the government, are responsible for the actual terror attacks or provided support to the terrorists in those attacks. Those are what are called high-value detainees, and there are 15 that are housed um, in that particular prison. Um, you say, well, what about the other 10? Um, there's obviously been a lot put out there about where these individuals were prior to coming to Guantanamo Bay. Um, if you, you know, do your research, I'm not telling you anything, it's not public information. They, a lot of them were housed at what are called CIA black sites. And um, there's been some issues raised about some of the techniques that were utilized at that time to gather information from these detainees. Um, a lot of that information, um, if it went to a commission or a court, um, possibly that evidence could be suppressed because of some of the techniques that were used to gather that information. So those individuals most likely will never be charged. They will stay there, but they will never be charged. Is Osama bin Laden's Jeep driver there? <laughs> Osama bin Laden's bodyguard was there at one time. He was. Okay. He was. I want to ask you more about that. That sounds interesting. Sounds fascinating. Um, then just to follow up, just so we're, you know, I'm, I'm consistent here. There's 15 that are housed in the high value detainee. Uh, there's 26 that are called low value detainees, which are people who are still terrorists, but were more like foot soldiers probably. Mm -hmm. Did a lot of the dirty work, but weren't really responsible for the planning and the actual operation that went down. So, and those folks um, are probably never gonna leave Guantanamo either. Um, I don't remember the guy's name, but he wrote the book Guantanamo Diaries. Diaries. Was he there? He was actually a detainee that when, was there. When you were there? He was released right before I got there. He actually okay. has been released. Um, I think he actually was interviewed on 60 Minutes, if yeah. I recall. Mm -hmm. um, wrote a book. You can actually buy his book. Uh, if you buy his book, probably three-fourths of it's going to be redacted. A lot the, of it was. <laughs> uh, I haven't actually read it, but uh, uh, I've seen it, and I picked it up, and a lot of it's redacted um, just because a lot of it's considered probably classified information. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, if you're interested, this is just, you know, for anyone who ever watches this, there's, there's some really good books about Guantanamo in the background. 
Um, probably the best book that I've read uh, is a book called Black Banners. Black Banner. Black Banner. Okay. Um, it is written by a former FBI agent um, who um, was uh, at some of those CIA black sites and um, interviewed uh, a lot of the high value detainees and the 9-11-5. Interesting background, kind of just putting everything in context. Then there's another book that's kind of almost the polar opposite of Black Banners, a book called Enhanced Interrogation. And that was written by um, uh, a psychologist mm -hmm. who was hired by the military to come up with uh, various techniques to get information from these detainees. Um, and it's fascinating uh, in terms of some of the techniques that he developed, um, some of which have now been determined by the military to be torture and have been outlawed. I think the American Psychological Association kicked him out. Kicked him out. <laughs> Mitchell's his name. Um, but it's interesting because from his perspective, um, you know, obviously it's a, it's a biased perspective, I'm sure, is that he was just doing what he was told to do. You know, I, I was hired to do a job, I did my job, and now, now you are wanting to, you know, blame me for coming up with all these, you know, what a lot of people are saying, torture. Um, but interesting book. Do we capture anybody anymore? I mean, are there any new prisoners going into Guantanamo anymore? During the Obama administration, it was pretty much determined that there's going to be no new prisoners coming to Guantanamo. Um, President Trump has kind of left that open. So when, actually, when I left, um, it's kind of interesting. Uh, one of my roles, it was kind of a side role, um, was I helped facilitate the transfer of uh, 22 detainees that left when I was there. When I first got there, um, there were um, 50, 53, 54 detainees. And when I left, that was more than that, 60 some, because um, there's 41 now. so. Um, 22 left when I was there during that year period. So one of my uh, responsibilities was to assist with the transfer teams that actually transferred the prisoners or detainees from Guantanamo to their, their next destination. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of an interesting um, perspective to see those folks that got to leave Guantanamo. But they were happy to leave, I bet. You know, it's interesting. I would say probably 90% were happy to leave. Some, I think, were a little reluctant to leave. And, you know, that's kind of like, I mean, I know your, your background is psychology. I think sometimes you get just accustomed that that's your life. And, you know, they've been there for 15, 16 years. And so there's, there's sometimes comfort in stability. I remember uh, I worked out at the prison as a psychologist for a while. We we're getting ready to release a prisoner out there. He had served all his time. He served years and mm -hmm. years. He refused to leave. Yeah. And he said, if you're going to put me on a Greyhound bus, I'm going to stab the driver to death. So I so, get put back in. Yeah. So, so I think they ended up finding a halfway yeah, house. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I think what well, some people call it, what, institutionalized? Did yeah. they get institutionalized? It was his home. I mean, yeah. it was I mean, and I think there were a few was, you know? that probably, if they were honest, probably didn't want to leave. That's just my gut feeling, though. Was your wife able to come down? Any? She was. That was that was one of the great really? benefits of Guantanamo is that uh, um, there's what's called Space A flights from um, either Washington D.C. or from Norfolk to where family members can get what's called Space A as long as there's you know seats available. How about they, the boys? Did the boys come down? Boys didn't get to come because my son was in college, so he huh. he was never able to come, and my youngest. It was his senior year, so he was actively involved in sports throughout. He had golf and basketball, yeah. Yeah. so he Quant could just never, well, like, Dan, you Dad, know, I'll send see me him. pictures. I'll see so, him when he gets home. <laughs> uh, but my wife got to come twice. She got to come Great. Um, in December for a week, and then she came back uh, at the end of March, So, which was kind of nice because it kind of broke up, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, it was kind of definitely... Uh, you know, it picks you up to see your family. What was your rank? Commander. What is that? 
Is that like a major? It's the equivalent Army? of lieutenant colonel in the Army or Marines. Okay. So O five. So. Now you went in as a O. I went in as uh, in the Navy as an ensign, which is an O one. O one. Um, and then. Mm -hmm. The Navy structures, you become an ensign, lieutenant, junior grade, lieutenant, lieutenant commander, commander, and then captain. Okay. So. A captain is like a colonel? Like a colonel. Okay. Sorry, I was in the Navy. That's Army. all right. <laughs> Everybody asks you that question, probably. Um, so, um, did you bring back any souvenirs from Guantanamo? Or, I mean, what could you bring? Uh, Guantanamo, actually, it's a beautiful, I mean, it's an island. It's about 30 miles long. Mm -hmm. um, it's right there on the Caribbean. So, I mean, you've got beautiful, pristine blue waters. Um, you know, beaches, you know, you don't really have the sandy beaches, but you do have beach areas. Um, Were you allowed to take pictures? Took pictures. Some spots, yeah. okay. Yeah, we could take pictures. There's certain areas we couldn't take. We couldn't take any pictures of the of where I worked at, um, but you know, you could take pictures of the, you know, where, where I lived and you know the beach areas and stuff like that. You could take now this pictures. is in Cuba. Cuba. So um, were you? Was there any any interaction with the Cubans? No, there's they're still um, at least when I was there, and it's still that way today. Um, you're not able to actually go inside the Cuban. They're still mad. They're still mad. I think Mr. Trump made him a little mad or two recently. So, uh, but yeah. So. Okay. Um, uh, is is any of your other family in the military? Like your father's grandfather? My, my father uh, was in the Navy. He uh, enlisted in the Navy right out of high school, and he did four years in the Navy, and it helped pay for his college. That's what he he didn't have a lot of funds when he uh, his family was very poor. No. So he joined the Navy, and then that... Uh, was he in Vietnam, or...? Uh, he was in right before. He was in um, 1964 to 68. Mm -hmm. So... Um, Maybe but, we can interview him sometime. Yeah. Uh, but Tell he, him about this. I will. Yeah. He, uh, he was a... Uh, he, he was an enlisted uh, person, but he did... Um, he was kind of like what you describe as to be a flight attendant today. If you he he flew uh, on planes. He he logged over. Oh my goodness! I think over two thousand flights. He still has his flight book. Um, but he was kind of like a flight attendant. Is okay. how you describe it. That's what Somebody's he tells me. Somebody's got to do it. Yeah, but he loved it. He he went to all um, all kinds of countries. Um, Mike, is there anything else you'd you'd like to say? You got any interesting military stories? I mean. Um, it's all been interesting, uh, but anything else you'd like to add? Uh, you know, I just, you know, Guantanamo was probably the, the highlight of my career, so to speak. I mean, it just it was probably the one job that I felt that I was really being part of what I thought was a good cause. You know, not that my other 21 years of service weren't productive, but that was probably the highlight of my career. Um, being deployed for those who have been deployed, um, you know, you live, you eat, you sleep with these individuals for a year. So I've, to this day, I've got three people that will be best friends for me for the rest of my life. Forever. Just because, mm -hmm. I mean, we literally work together and, you know, spend our time off duty together and weekends together. and. You know, they were they become your family, so it's it's amazing. You know, I had I had been deployed to Bahrain, but it really wasn't deployed like this was. I mean, this was, you know, this was really this real. was this was a real deal. So um, you, you you get such a more respect for individuals. You know, I'm in the military, been in it for 22 years, but I have such a much more respect for the men and women who who have been deployed three, four, five, six times. I mean, it is. It's hard to leave your family, um, but it's so rewarding because you get, I have memories that will last forever and friends that, you know, two years ago I didn't know these three individuals, but today they're, you know, we literally text every day. Where do they live? Um, probably my closest buddy, he's an army guy, his name's Doug. And Doug, was he at Guantanamo? He was in Guantanamo. They have army there? They have army. The Joint Task Force, which I was telling you, is predominantly army. Um, all the actual 
prison guards or army. Um, we also had probably, in my legal unit, we had 28 um, attorneys. Um, we had Air Force, we had Marine, Army, and Navy. So, mm -hmm. I mean, we had the full gamut of, mm -hmm. you know. These guards have a, it sounds like a rough job. Sounds like a difficult job. I know out at the prison, being a CO there is not easy. You know, at first, probably, now it's, it's um, they're, they're so professional. I mean, I have such an admiration for them. I mean, they run such a professional shop there. There have been times where it was probably difficult, but they've now got it to the point where, I mean, it's basically just a federal prison on an island. So, mm -hmm. um, but I mean, it is a difficult job. I mean, you're dealing with terrorists every day. So, are there female uh, guards? There are, and it's interesting because one of the issues I was there, um, you bring up female guards, is that you know a lot of the um, individuals who are there, they're all obviously mostly are Muslim, and they have some uh, pretty strong views when it comes to females touching them. So there for a while, um, the high-value detainees refused to be transported if there was a female guard. Um, they did not want female guards touching them. So uh, initially, the military respected that and said, okay, you know, we, we, we will not have female guards. Well, the female guards uh, brought in equal opportunity action and said, listen, you know, being a guard at Guantanamo Bay as an MP, that's the highlight of my career. And you're restricting me from being able to promote and be having to have that opportunity to take probably one of the highest sought out jobs there is in the in the army is to be a guard at Guantanamo Bay. You wouldn't think it is, but it, it's it's really a very highly sought after job. Um, so they won that lawsuit and said, you know, you cannot restrict females from being guards. So today there are female guards. Uh, that actually have interactions with the detainees. And so. the detainees' reaction, I'd say. Initially, and, and even when I was there, they had a few altercations, but for the most part, they've realized that they're just going to have to what deal with What kind of it. leverage do they have, you know? <laughs> true, true. Oh, you were going to tell me where your friend lived. Yeah, my, my good friend Doug. Doug, um, I got to Guantanamo in September, and he got there in, in August. So we basically were there pretty much the entire time together. Um, he's a county judge in uh, Indiana. Uh, so, you know, we have a lot of similarities together. He has children that are similar in age to mine. Um, we both love sports. We both love swimming and biking and running. So we just kind of became best buddies. So I literally... Uh, I would say if we don't text every day, it's every other day. And it's sometimes it's just, hey, how you doing? Because we just became best friends. Been buddies. over to his house, take the families? We, we're actually going to go over the spring uh, uh, to, to, to meet him um, for kind of our, our reunion. Okay. And then I've got another really good friend who's an active duty Air Force um, attorney. And him and his family are in Colorado. He's now at uh, Peterson Air Force Base in Colorado, and uh, we have plans to, to meet up with them in the summer. Mm -hmm. So um, those are probably my two really, really good buddies. And then there's a third buddy of mine who is a reservist who we deployed together. But even though we're a small unit, I had seen him, and we probably had very limited discussions um, in the 20 years I've been in the Navy. Um, I mean, I knew him to see him, but I just didn't know him. But when you deploy together, you become really good friends. So he, he's become a great friend of mine, too. And, you know, we... Uh, Where's he live? He lives in Washington, D.C. Okay. So... Okay. Uh, anything else you'd like to say? What, what ribbons and decorations do you have? Uh, I have? I have a few just personal decorations, but... Um, uh, I'm, I'm probably more proud of my, my unit decorations, which oh. are when we do it as a team. I mean, individual awards are nice, but if you get a team award, it's, I think it's much more meaningful. So we got a joint service award um, when we left Guantanamo, which is probably the one I'm most proud of, and it's more of a team award than it is an right. individual award. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. 
Good? Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah.